Matter series and the Animal Matter series. Um, I'm Dr. Emily McCobb. I'm the direct, assistant director of the Center for Animals and Public Policy. Um, our, our Animal Matter series is a new time talk series of new time talks that are designed to sort of engage the community about animal, uh, issues surrounding animals and people. So we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Temple Grandin here to be the first speaker this year. Um, we had um, a successful lecture um, in Worcester last night. And she's been with us all day, spending time with our veterinary students and our Center for Animals students. So it's a really great opportunity for us. Um, I have several people to thank for all the work and organization that it took into putting together this um, this series of talks. Um, most importantly, uh, Susan Grogan, who, as always, has put in her organizational talents to keeping everything uh, running smoothly. And behind the scenes, uh, Ginny Shugru and Lee Browning really did a lot of work just to make sure that we had everything in place uh, for the visit. Um, the students at the Student Livestock Organization were the first ones to really approach Dr. Grant and invite her to come, um, especially Katie Lampin and Casey Penrod. So we really owe them a debt of gratitude because this is um, hugely significant for us. Grana doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll say a few words about her. Um, for those of us that have been working in this area for a long time, she's really one of our heroes. Um, I first learned about her when I was a veterinary student, and one of my classmates had approached her about a facility that we were designing. She wanted to design it um, in tune with animal welfare needs, and Dr. Grana was gracious enough at that time to come to Tufts and help us with the design for that facility. Oh, there's your suits down here in the front. Oh yeah, come on down. <laughs> Um, she is currently a professor of animal science at Colorado State University, and she's really one of the leading experts on humane livestock handling in the world. Um, Time Magazine has recently uh, identified her as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And what I like about what she'll talk about is uh, putting objective standards on subjective states of animal, law, animal welfare and stress reduction, um, as well as a practical hands-on approach. So the work that she does makes a difference for animals um, in the real world, and that's one of her big focuses, and that's one of the things that we want to highlight about her talk. Um, she holds a PhD um, in, from the University of Illinois in animal science, and she's published over 400 articles and numerous books on animal livestock handling and welfare. Um, and you probably know her also from the popular media and the recent HBO documentary that was done. So I'm going to turn the mic over to her, and I uh, have a lot of things to talk about today. And uh, one really important basic principle, I don't care what animal you handle, a calm animal is easier to handle. If it's calm, it's easier to handle. If it gets all excited, it's going to take it 30 minutes to calm back down. So let's say you bring a horse into the clinic, he pulls a big fit, might be a really good idea to let him calm down for 20 minutes or so before you try to work on him. They get upset instantly, but it takes a long time to calm down. Well, what happens? They get scared. They get fearful. Well, some people might say, well, that's anthropomorphic to say that animals have fear. Well, they have fear. That's definitely been scientifically proven. Now, the animal's world is sensory-based. It's not word-based. It's a world of pictures, picture memories, touch memories, sound memories, taste memories. It's detailed, sensory-based information. Now, as a person with autism, I think in pictures. You know, there's a lot of artists and graphic designers that think in pictures. And a lot of those people are really good with animals because they can relate to the very, very specific way that an animal thinks. Very specific. You want to understand animal behavior, you want to get away from verbal language. You've got to think about what that animal's world is not based in language. Language is a lot more abstract. Now, there's some evidence in human beings that language covers up sensory-based thinking. Because there's a type of Alzheimer's that from the temporal lobe dimension wrecks the language centers, and then most well, important work comes in. I want you to watch animal postural things. You see how the zebra and the horse have an ear on each other, and then the other ear is on me. Watch that. Another sign that an animal's getting upset is the whites of the eyes will show. See the whites of the eyes bugging out? That horse or that cow is getting upset. You horse the cow with the tail's going like this and there's no flies on it, that animal's not happy. That's your warning. They might kick. There's been some interesting new research on eye problems. The animal uses its right brain to look at things that might be dangerous. 
Well, the left eye tends to look at things that are dangerous. And the right eye, which is attached to the left brain, tends to look at things that are nice, like feed wagon and stuff like that. <laughs> and then you might have things that start out scary that then switch to nice. You know, this is something that's been learned, it's called lateral research in a lot of different animals, that there's an eye preference uh, for the uh, left eye to look at something that might possibly be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Look at how that animal's avoiding that streak of light. You know, I'm always getting asked, the cattle probably are going to get slaughtered. They're more worried about things like this streak of light. A chain hanging down in a chute, a reflection on the floor, things we tend to not notice. In fact, if you want to see how a modern slaughter plant works, I've got a video now on YouTube. You can access it by typing in Temple Brandon uh, Beef Packing Plants Video Tour. You type that into Google, it will come right up. And it shows them uh, walking, you know, shows how the whole plant procedure works. Even the stuff is not so pretty, like all the reflexes. There's another video circling around on the internet. Uh, showing uh, all the, the back legs dairy cows kicking after they've been shot and they're brain dead. And it implies that they're alive. Well, they're not alive. I didn't touch anything up here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's close to the lighting system. Hopefully you still see my slides okay. There's an example of a chain hanging down in a shoe. I have been working on this subject for 40 years. Why do I have to keep talking about chains hanging down in shoes? Because people don't take them out. People are not seeing them. That's why I have to keep talking about it. Animals notice little stuff that we tend to not see. A little reflection off a car bumper. Or maybe the sun's coming up over the top of the, of the, of the building and they don't want to go in the building because the sun's blinding. And another time of day, then everything's just fine. So what am I touching? You're not touching it. I'm not touching it. <laughs> I didn't think I was touching anything. I want you to get down and shoot and see what they're seeing. Look how on a sunny day you've got shadows there. A cloudy day, you're not going to have any shadows. You may get time of day effects. So there'll be a reflection off the cars one time of day, but not at another time of day. Get the vehicles away from a panic soil. They can cause a lot of walking. I can see people through the fence. Well, I've either got to get those people out of the cow's flight zone, or I've got to cover up the side. You've got an animal that's jumping around in the chute. Often they're doing that because you're too close back up, get away from it. You know, unless the hollow brake broke a tame animal, it's going to have some flights on it. And it's jumping around because it doesn't like you being supposed to. Back up away from it. Or you got to cover the side and shoot up. you got to do one or the other. Now, animals, uh, you know, form concepts by putting specific examples in the categories. Animal thinking is very specific. There was a study done with a horse. And they got this horse trained. Now the blue and white umbrella was safe. You didn't have to be afraid of a blue and white umbrella. They thought, oh, blue and white umbrella, maybe that should transfer to other strange things like an orange tarp. Uh-uh. An orange tarp scared the horse that was accustomed to the blue and white umbrella. You see, it's a different picture. See, animal thinking is very specific. So you can get animals get specific fears. Like maybe diesel powered equipment's bad. If it runs a gas engine, it's good. Because the diesel powered sound was associated with uh, being attacked by construction equipment, for example. This happened to be an elephant. And somebody probably attacked it with a backhoe or something really bad like that. So if it's got a diesel engine, then it's, uh, it's scary and bad. Well, a common uh, uh, category in horses and cattle is man on the back. Man on the ground, two different things. Both the mind of the cattle and the mind of the horse. I've seen horses where you can ride them, but they're horrible for veterinary work. Absolutely, totally horrible when you've got to do veterinary work. Because something bad happened on the ground, but they're okay to ride. Or you can have a horse you can't ride, and he's totally fine for all the shoeing and work you do on the ground. See the different picture. It's like two categories in the horse's brain. And I've seen cattle that come in from the West that have only been worked on a horse. And they are terrified when they get people on the ground. I'm always getting asked about the cattle milling and the slaughter. I'll tell you, some of the worst cattle to have a meat packing plant since everything is done on the ground is cattle that see the first man on the ground at a slaughter plant. You want dangerous? 
They got a 50 foot flight zone and a 20 foot pad and they're bouncing off the walls. No matter where you go, uh, you're in the flight zone, not a good thing. You see the horse, the cattle might have a three foot flight zone with the man on the ground, man on the horse. The 50 foot flight zone, the man on the back. So it's important to get animals used to different things. Used to four wheelers, used to the horse, used to the, uh, 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 the person walking. So get them used to different things. You saw the worst animals go berserk when you bring them into town are the ones that have had no different experiences at home. How many people have had their horse go berserk and shut? It was fine at home when crazy or shut. Anybody that shows has probably had that happen. Well, you better get him used to flags, bikes, and always before he goes for show. On the leash, off the leash. The dog will treat that as two different categories. When I'm on the leash, I protect my owner, and when I'm off the leash, I can go play. This is why it's important for dogs to get socialization in the dog park so they get off leash time socializing with other dogs. It's very important that dogs get socialized with toddlers because you don't want to get a dog thinking toddlers prey. They gotta learn that toddlers go in the people fight. They are nice to all toddlers. And it's really important that young puppies get introduced to toddlers in a really, really nice way. You gotta make this a good experience for the dog. Don't let the kids maul a dog. You wanna make the puppy think that toddlers are nice. But the thing is, that little person looks different than that big person. Here's a horse that was terrified of black cowboy hats. Because during a veterinary procedure, Somebody threw an alcohol in his face. And that person was wearing a black hat. And right when this happened, the horse was looking right at the black hat. White cowboy hat, no problem. Ball caps, no problem. See, different picture. When I put the hat on the ground, it wasn't as scary. But then as I brought the hat closer and closer and closer up to my head, the more scary it got. That horse was wide-eyed, eyes would start fucking out, and uh, not a happy camper. Now I'm going to have a pretty difficult time eliminating all black hats in the world. And I can work on training this horse to not be afraid of black hats. But you know what? I may never totally, completely fix it. You know, he's never going to be totally safe around black hats. I can make him better. But it's, uh, it's not a good thing. Now notice the horse's ears there. Where do you think that ear is pointing? Right at me taking a picture. That's where the ear is pointing. Now objects with a similar shape might cause the same problem. I had a black purse that looked just like that. I spent an hour on purse websites just to find that purse. <laughs> and, you know, I typed black purses into Google. And I'm pretty sure that if uh, you'd seen that purse, you might be afraid of it. But it's sort of approximately the same shape. What I've observed is there is some generalization. There was a horse that was afraid of long, narrow things, like shuffle handles, or there's going to be microphone stands. Uh, that neck pole might be enough like a black purse. The thing about fear memories is they tend to be specific. A dog often gets afraid of the place where he was hit by a car because he was looking at Jones's mailbox right when he got hit by the car. So he associates that with the bad experience. A horse will be good with one type of bit, but be bad with another type of bit. A real common one is there's a really horrible jointed snap of wire bits you can get on the internet that wreck a horse's mouth. Once a horse has had one of those, any jointed bits in the bad category. Dogs can recognize the voices of the good and bad people, and a common generalization that dogs will make is, guys are bad. They just say it, guys. <laughs> or they'll think guys with beards are bad, or guys with long hair are bad, or girls with blonde hair are bad. They'll, they'll, they'll tune into some obvious feature like that. All right, those are horrible things. Yes, they sell some really bad things on the internet, and that really cut up the horse's mouth. And if he's been uh, really abused or something like that, any bit that's jointed is bad. Now, one of the ways I can fix this behavior is use a one-piece bit. Because a one-piece bit is a different feeling. Take different kinds of bits and hold them in your hands and shut your eyes and see how they're different feeling pictures. And if I can make a different feeling picture, then I can sometimes get out of that bad file, and that fixes it. The other thing is, when you're troubleshooting behavior problems, don't be vague. I've got to ask a lot of questions. 
lots and lots of questions. And I was just talking yesterday to the student who picked me up at the airport. There was this dog that was uh, uh, chewing a hole through the plasterboard in the house to get out. You know, couldn't, uh, couldn't wreck the door, so I like, ate the wall to get out. <laughs> well, what happened? You see, the thing I've got to find out, what was there some event that happened? This dog had been good, now it's doing this kind of stuff? Well, it had been in the vet hospital, had some surgery done. The dog didn't like crates either. It ate up like five airline crates. And they couldn't heat up the cages in the vet hospital. Then after it had its operation, now it's like trying to chew the ball in. But I had to ask quite a few questions before I found out that all this problem started after it had an operation. You know, you've got to find out exactly what's going on. He will come to me and go, my dog is crazy. What do you mean by that? Do you come home from work and it's happy to see you and it jumps on you? That could be crazy. Is it biting your visitors? Maybe that's crazy. What exactly did it do? I find people are way too vague when they're trying to diagnose behavior problems. You've got to be a lot more specific. You've got to ask a ton of questions. I like to ask a ton of questions to where I can start visualizing what that animal actually did. You know, was, you know, how this behavior gets started. You know, I, I, there's a lot of things I gotta know. This horse got scared of long, straight things. Well, anything that looked like this, he would be afraid of. What had happened to this particular horse, he fell over in the cross ties, and his lead rope went down like this. That's a long, straight thing. Then I talked to another lady who said me, told me the horse was crazy. She said, I don't know why I was doing this horse, she's crazy. Well, after I questioned her, in a meeting like this, like 10 different questions, I finally found out that he was only crazy in the cross ties. He was good everywhere else. I said, stop using the cross ties. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Sometimes it's easy just to take the thing they're afraid of out of their life. Now, I can work on desensitizing, but the problem is there's no delete. The fear memories are very permanent. I have to train his brain to suppress the fear memory. And if he's a really high strung nervous genetics, he's going to have a stronger fear memory. Then you have separation distress. That is a different emotional system than fear. Separation distress and fear, two totally different emotional systems in the brain. And the science that shows that that's true is all over in the neuroscience literature. One of the big problems we have in science is people don't read across the literature. You know, neuroscience got their journals, veterinarians have their journals, animal science has got their stuff, psychology's got their stuff, pathology's got their stuff, zoo animals have got their stuff. People are not reading across disciplines. Well, that's not a horse, that's for sure. But maybe if it's horizontal, maybe it won't be so scary. This other horse, he was terrified of naked white cats. If you put saddle on top, it was fine. Think about it. It's a different picture with the saddle on top. Fear memories were already talked about. We can't erase them. We can train the brain to suppress them. But they don't really have a belief. First experiences with new things, like a milking parlor, new people, the horse trailer, things like this. These need to be good first experiences. How about the dog's first experience with a crate? I was at the airport just last week, and they, they, they had to take the dog out of the kennel. So they put the kennel in the, in the x-ray machine, and this poor little dog absolutely did not want to get back in his kennel. He'd never been trained. The only time he was ever put in that kennel was when he had to travel. It was always bad. They trying to stuff the TSA guy in the trying to stuff his dog back in this little soft carry-on bag that he had to go into to go on the plane. He should have been trained to that long before he ever got to the airport, that this is a safe place and a good place. And flighty animals need to be habituated to new things much more gradually and much more carefully. So you have to be really careful about the frightening. This just shows you kind of levels of handling stress. Okay, you got beef cattle with a lot of rough handling, I got really high cortisol levels. Then I got beef cattle with flat handling, I really reduced the cortisol levels. I got the dairy cows are even lower. Why are they lower? Dairy cows voluntarily go in the park. A real basic principle is when you force animals to do stuff, 
So you get a lot more fear stress compared to when they do things voluntarily. So let's train those new heifers to go to the park. Let's take your beef cows and uh, beef heifers and walk them to the chutes and take them in the corrals and have some good first experiences. Sometimes we've got to do some things that animals don't like, but it's really important that it not be their first experience. There's the teaching animals to cooperate with blood samples. Nobody thought we could train this. We did this 15 years ago. Nobody thought we could train them. Well, you have to introduce something like a sliding door opening very slowly. The first day we open it at inch, shh, and the orient. And you know, the brain's deciding to throw a better do I just stay still. Next day we moved it this much. Next day this much. It took 10 days just to train it to the sliding door. But if you it orients, and then the brain makes a decision. Do I keep walking or do I go berserk? In the brain, you've got a thing called the nucleus accumbens, a switch in the brain. It's actually in the, and the switch can go into fear mode or keep watching mode. It switched in one way or the other. Flooding animals tends to be more finicky and balanced towards fear. Let's make sure you give the dog when you put it on the table a non-slip foil and have that puppy straddle the part. I asked Cheryl to find cute pictures on the internet and every one of them the puppies straddled apart there because it's slip bang. Just give it something non-slip to stand on. How about a bath mat with a rubber backing? You can have the clients bring it home. And no sudden jerky motion. Sudden jerky motion scares. Also, if you got a hold of a puppy, it's going to have optimal pressure. Not too tight, not too loose. And that even applies to cattle when you put them in a hydraulic squeeze. You gotta hold them with it, not mangle them with it. You know, the mistake that people make is when they when they start to fight it, to squish them tighter. And you've also got to make sure you don't trigger the fear of falling. So when you hold it, it feels supported. That's really important. It feels off balance, it's gonna fight. I'm amazed at the things that I have fixed to the non-slip floor. It's a really, really simple thing. It really fixes it. Do animals have emotions? Well, Prozac works on dogs. Not the same neurotransmitters. And the emotional systems are located in the subcortex of the brain. And they have been mapped. The main difference between human emotions and dog emotions is complexity. Because we filter our emotions through a gigantic computer upstairs here. The dog doesn't have as big a computer. And that's why the dog might associate getting hit with the car with the Jones's mailbox. We never do. That's what's called higher order association. Okay, these are the core emotional systems as outlined by Jack Penskeck. Fear, that's the emotion, makes an animal avoid getting eaten by predators. You have rage, and then fight the predator off. Then you have your separation distress, what they call panic. Then you've got seeking, which is approach things. So when that animal hurt that door, well, do I just watch, or do I flip out and have a big fear attack right now? And then you've also got the emotions of sex, love and young nurturing behavior, that's an uh, oxytocin system, seeking is the dopamine system, and then you have play. And you want science, there's a lot of science on this, but most of it is in the neuroscience literature. I recently did a review article with Nancy Perlbeck and Cheryl Morris for uh, a zoo conference, it's now in Journal Animal Science, December issue on, on some of these emotional systems, and I reviewed some of this old literature. The nucleus comments in the brain can either go into seek mode or it can go into fear mode. It can kind of oscillate back and forth. See how those animals are coming up to that clipboard? And then when the wind blows the paper, they run away. And then the paper stops blowing and they come back again. They used to call it curiously afraid. See what's happening is it's switching back and forth with seek and fear. So you get seek turned on, it turns fear off. That's one of the ways to help the young tip the force over the black hat. The one clever way that the trainer told me to get on the seat would be to tie the hat to a string, and then I'd move the hat along the ground, and maybe they'll follow it. They'll turn on seeking. But the problem is that horses never are going to be 100% safe around black hats. You know, they have more, you know, more likely to be safe if he's got a familiar rider that can kind of talk to him and keep him from getting too scared. The animal orients, it makes a decision. Do I seek or do I flee? Look at the ears there. One on the forest and one on the photography. That's what the ears are doing right there. 
When you're troubleshooting the behavior, you need to figure out which emotion is motivating that animal. You know, in fear and separation distress, they get mixed up all the time. You know, and there's a lot of controversies about Caesar Milan, different kinds of dog training methods. I, um, you know, something that might work with a low fear Rottweiler is not going to work with a dog that's got really bad separation stress. Should the owner be present during vet procedures? Yeah, it depends. You know, a lot of dogs, the owner can calm the dog down. And that's not happy camper there. That's what Christian McConnell calls white eye. He's got excellent books. The other end of the leash. Then she's got another book on animal emotions. I love that book because it shows all the different postures. She's got fabulous pictures in it. Of, uh, uh, and then uh, Nick Godman's got a book I really like on choosing a puppy because it talks about different genetic types of dogs. If you've got a high energy dog, that's not going to be very good for apartment living. You know, let's um, you know, get the right dog for the right personality for people and the place where it's going to live. Now, if it's a, you know, the owner can calm the dog down, the owner should be there. Well, what happens if a drug dealer brings in his pit bull? Should he be there? No. No. <laughs> you want him 10 miles down the road. You don't want him in the waiting room. 10 miles down the road. Because that pit bull is going to protect that druggie against you. You know. Now, let's say the policeman brings in his guard dog. Should the policeman be there? That's going to depend on how the dog's trained. And if the dog is trained, strange people can handle you with the tongue toys in the mouth, then at least one can beat it. What can we do to prevent abnormal behavior? Let's work on not getting it started in the first place. These dogs can chew themselves up. A lot of that separation distress. There's a real problem. I went to some fancy hotel down in Washington, D.C., and a soldier had a German Shepherd that had no tail. They asked him what happened to his dog's tail, and he said, bit it off. Well, they're keeping some of these dogs kenneled, and they're going stir crazy. What do gerbils need? What do hens need? These are animals that in the wild are prey. So gerbils, they want to hide from stuff. Hens, when they lay their egg, they want to pry a place to lay it, where they can be hidden and feel safe. So one of the things you may need to get the hen out of the farm is a private nest box. And there's some systems that do that. But what do dogs need? They need lots of seeking activities and they need lots of human companionship because so they don't get separation stress or panic. They don't like that word panic. It's too easy to mix it up with fear. That's a neuroscience term for separation distress. Don't think it's a very good term, but that's the term that's used. Now there's genetic differences and how much how much a dog is a seeker. Like some labs, you've got the big heavy lab. They, they're great dog for a guy in a wheelchair. Lay around all day, then you got the long skinny labs. All they want to do is run and run and run and run. They make a really lousy dog for a guy in a wheelchair. And they both labs. That's genetic differences. Some animals had a lot more trouble with separation stress. What do horses need? Careful habituation, new things so we don't get fear reactions. Well, let's try to prevent some of that cribbing by feeding them some long hay. Don't feed colts so much brain. And they also need social companions. What's a polar bear need? Think about what the animal does in the wild. Horses get mouth stereotypes. Why do horses crib? Horses are razors. So their abnormal behavior involves their mouth. The polar bear paces. What do polar bear do in the wild? They walk. Miles and miles and miles and miles. That's why they, they uh, pace it. Now, animals that are reared alone often are really bad about attacking other animals. Animals need to learn social relationships with other animals. Really important. But why is the dairy bull the most dangerous animal in the farmyard? Because he's reared by himself. And he doesn't learn that he's cat. Then when he gets sexually mature at 18 months, two years of age, he turns on the dairyman. Because he views the dairyman as a sexual rival for mates. Dangerous deal. One of the ways to make a bull a lot safer would be to rear it on a nurse cow in a social group with other cattle. And then it's not going to be interested in attacking people. You know, beef bulls, beef bulls, you know, you can make killer herpers. You take little herpers bull calves, put them in the pen by themselves, they'll be killer bulls when they grow up. Real dangerous. Dogs that are rear alone, awful. I'm fighting other dogs, just awful. 
Horses that are rear alone, awful about fighting other horses. It isn't just a stud thing, it's a lack of socialization thing. Dogs, I'm really concerned they're not getting enough socialization. My generation, you let the dog out in the morning and play around and had a social life. How many behavior problems do we have? Just about none. Puppies chewed up things. Dogs were not eating up houses. That wasn't happening. Dogs were not fighting people. One of the reasons is because they were socialized. Other dogs and other people. Now the other thing that was different is we didn't have people deliberately breeding vicious dogs. We didn't have that kind of stuff going on. How do we keep stockmanship good? I designed a livestock of good. And one of my biggest frustrations is to build something nice, only about 20% of people stay good. It's really easy for people to slip back into old rough habits. That's why you have to measure stuff. How do we get into a mess like 20% of dairy cows are lame? Well, we just didn't see them. We kept selecting for more and more milk, and they gradually got more lame, and you got used to seeing lame dairy cows. You manage stuff that you measure. I've done a lot of work on developing auditing programs that are used for the beef packing plants, used out on farms. And if you measure stuff, then maybe you're going to manage it. These are your three basic kinds of variables for auditing animal welfare. And the tendency now is to go towards animal-based outcome measures. Like, for example, lameness, body condition score, other condition. Then you have some practices you may get rid of, like a certain kind of very, very intensive housing, small battery cages, and getting away from telling people exactly how to do things. Like, I'm not going to tell you how to build a free stock for dairy cow. I'll leave it up to your ingenuity to do that. You still need a few input variables, like ammonia levels, some space requirements. There's still a few of those that you need, but it used to all be input variables, like telling you how to build stuff. Now the trend is going towards these outcome-based measures. Well, how about handling? I can measure how many fall down. Well, if you're a meat plant and you want to pass the McDonald's on it, and you have more than 1% of those cattle fall down, you're going to fail a lot. How many animals are moving and vocalizing while you're moving them? How many are running? How many do you use electric prod What about electric rods? Some people say, well, let's stay on you got an animal that absolutely won't go and squeeze you. What's better? Bust the tail off or one or two buzzes? You, know, you want to do the one or two buzzes and then you put it away. Normally in my class, we don't have to use the electric product, but this one boy would not get in the squeeze shoot. And uh, he just wasn't going to go. He was a real tame, old, lazy one, tame and lazy. And he wasn't going to go. And when I used the, the potch off the wall, hangs on the wall. Buzzed and buzzed and I put it back on the wall and made real point and I put it back up on the wall. In other words, not carrying it around. Only, and all the other cattle we handle for that. But if you ban it, then what do you do? Hit it, bring your sail up. That's not something you want to do. And I tried all my nice handling methods. One of the things you can do if this was the tailgate of shoot and lined up here, sometimes if I just walk back by it like this, Walk back by in the opposite direction, they'll go forward. Now try that. Another thing you can do, take your hand like this down the back. I call it the chiropractor. Start at the shoulders, go right down the back. And so I, you know, I did that on a couple of those and it did work. You know, then he wasn't going to go. Uh, and and uh, I had other cattle in behind them. I, you know, there's a, so you don't ban them, but you want to get it down to where it's used at an extremely low level. Like in a big meat packing plant, you want an excellent score of 5%. You know what it used to be when we first started? 500%. That was terrible. Okay. Lights of the eyes show. Switch and tail. Sweating and horses. Heads up. And they'll probably be looking at you with a left eye. Okay. I can use measurement to show how I've documented a change. I put a light on the entrance of the chute. I had people trained to only use the product when the pigs fought. And I went from 38% product down to 4 And all I did is duct tape the light to the entrance of the chute. Because they don't like going into the dark. There's an example of the light. Real simple thing. Lights up the way ahead. Another problem you can get into is animals that are just really difficult to handle. You have pigs. Nobody's walked through their pens. 
And then when somebody walks in their pen the day of loading, they can go to surf. Especially if they're a flighty type of pig. And there's a big difference between the easy to handle and the hard to handle pigs on the amount of squealing going on and the amount of electric car use. <coughs> when you're writing up guidelines, I want to ban these words, properly, accurate, sufficient. What does that mean? Handle them properly. I don't know what that means. I don't know how many guidelines I see where they use these stupid words. I don't have any idea what they mean. How do I train people to audit stuff using these ridiculous words? <laughs> a really good principle of animal welfare auditing is I measure a small number of critical control modes of directly observable things. You know what? People cheat and they fake records. I want to look at stuff that's directly observable. Let's take traffic rules as a model. What are the critical control points for traffic? If the police only enforce three things, it would probably work fine. Speeding, red light, and stop sign violations, and erratic driving. Those are the critical control points for traffic. We even use the same principle in working on animal welfare standards. It's not a paperwork audit. People fabricate paperwork. Every, those people want to just turn everything into a paperwork audit. It's ridiculous. Okay, let's say I'm under dairy. What are some of the outcome-based measures I should give the most emphasis to? Body condition score? How many skinny ones have I got? How many lame ones have I got? How many dirty cows have I got? How many animals have a swollen, if it's a dairy cow, a swollen hot? Or if it's a beef animal, or cancer eyes? You know, directly <coughs> observable things like that. In organic, no, it's not okay to have bald spots on cattle in the spring. That's lice, that's not okay. Some people think that's normal. No, it's not. How about ammonia levels in indoor facilities? And then maybe abnormal behavior, barbiting and sows, things like that. You know, but these are things that can be directly observed. Now, the thing, the reason why lameness is such a good outcome variable is look at all the different things that cause the cow to be lame. I mean, I score a dairy on lameness. I can go, okay, you got a problem with lameness. Now we're going to have to go in and find out why I got such a big problem with blame dairy gas. There's a lot of reasons. Badly designed free stalls. Rapid growth. Bad leg conformation. Uh, they got lousy hoof care. They got foot diseases. They got injured. A lot of different types. Now one of my big concerns is what I call overloading the animal's biology. Now you can do it for genetics, for either maximum production, or for maximum nose wrinkliness stability. <laughs> this gets any more wrinkly, he's going to suffocate. <laughs> That's an example of bad becoming normal. Over selecting the stupid appearance traits, or you're just going crazy on selecting for production. You know, and then this creeps up on you. The dairy cows start to get in trouble. The broiler chicken growing really fast. When we selected layers to lay more eggs, we also selected more aggressive layers. Pigs, some of the lean line pigs are very aggressive. In order to make group housing work, we're going to have to change some of the genetics. And you can overload this biology with too much high energy feed, you get liver abscesses, you know, feed additives like beta agonists, you give them too much of that in the summertime, they're gonna get lame, they're gonna get heat stress. Now when cattle are breathing with the mouth open, they are heat stressed. We've got some people now think it's okay for cattle to breathe with the mouth open. I go, no, it's not okay. That's bad becoming normal. Now, I think in the future this could be some of the worst problems both with pets and with farm animals. Well, what are some of the things that overloaded biology can cause? Lameness, too skinny, shorter life, you've got dairy cows lasting for only two lactations, neurological problems, I'm horrified all well, the stuff that's wrong with dogs these days. Just horrified. Giving them feed additives like beta agonists, those a lot of different things. Some of the, some genetic lines, high producing animals are more susceptible to disease. There's others that are not. What happened to that pig's ears? Now the pig had dinner. When the lean line pigs first came in, the amount of aggression and tail biting skyrocketed. Now nobody would deliberately breed a mean pig that bites out of pigs, but that was a side effect of indiscriminate a selection for rapid gain and leanness. Because well, unfortunately, the way they selected the pigs, they used individual selection. So in other words, the pigs had belly up in the feeder and shoved the other pigs away, they got selected. Because they can push the other pigs away from the feeder. The other gave more, but they accidentally selected for aggression. Yep, and then you got this kind of stuff. People think that's real pretty. 
you know, you put that together and you get um, deaf puppies and all kinds of other bad things. No, it's not pretty. I'll look at some of this stuff. Sharpays, my student had a Sharpay. This dog died from Cushing's disease. God, this dog is six years old and died. And it had all these fungal infections. It was disgusting. And she was bathing it in cortisol. And I said, let's for hex, let's do an experiment on this dog is such a mess. Let's put this dog on a gluten-free diet. And you know what? It helped gluten. It helped work. It actually did work. We just did it as like, like for goof. It actually did work. <laughs> it was just like a look. You had such extreme wrinkles. You smell help. Why are we breeding? Animals with these kind of problems. <coughs> then another student in our lab had that had this disgusting super wrinkled Sharpay on her screensaver. I look at that. I don't think that's cute. I think it's deformant. <laughs> that's not the way. Hey, we got the dairy cows that only last two lactations. Those are in a real nice environment there. You know, we have to be thinking of is optimal. No, we don't want to go back to the dairy cow in the 50s. No, we don't want to do that. When they back off a teensy bit, you know, what's optimal? Where we're keeping the, the biology good and we're not overloading it. There are some of my books on, on, on animal welfare. <laughs> I'm going to write down the video here. I'm writing down the keywords from Google so you can look at the. Uh, so you just type in the in temple, just go on the YouTube and type in Temple Brandon and then put a thief packing plant, thief packing plant video tour. And you can see how it works. I think Hag needs to make glass walls electronic. It's one of the first steps of doing it. And, uh, Okay, we're going to be dead here, but thank you all for coming.